Today on Built to Last, lives are in balance. And what is bigger than life size? And a hero who helped save lives. I was out on a patrol and noticed a freshly dug up pile of dirt, really. Lace up your boots and strap on your hard hat. It's time for Built to Last. Built to Last is brought to you by the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Labor and Management Committee and Armstrong Ceilings. Faster, easier, better. Welcome to Built to Last. I'm Mark Nelson. And I'm Monica Peterson. On today's episode, we'll meet a young man who aspired to become a superhero, but ended up becoming so much more. We'll also learn about another superhuman feat how one of the largest and most complex engineering projects in history is helping keeping our cities dry. And on a project of that scale, safety is essential. Actually, safety is priority one on every union job site. Here at the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Training and Apprentice Center, it's one of the core principles, and our first story explores why. Job sites across the nation buzz with the excitement of new construction and opportunity but there's also the specter of very real danger looming over our workers. For some, this danger can change their lives forever. My father's name was Roy Stanley Johnson. He was a craftsperson, served in the Vietnam War. He died on a job site when I was three years old. No son or daughter should ever have to go through that. That's how bad it is. You're lost. You don't have anyone to turn to. You don't, you don't have anyone to play ball with, you know, go fishing with. Scott's loss emphasizes how essential safety standards are and how hard the trades have worked to make job sites safer. Labor is committed to all things in the workplace. Dignity, respect, principle among all that is a safe work environment. Workers should come home to their family safe and sound you know, even after a hard day's work, and sometimes even it could be a dangerous occupation. It is very important to every member on that job site, whether you're a, you're a carpenter or a fitter or a HVAC guy, we all watch each other's back. And that's, you know, there's some union pride, as you say. Safety training, that's one of the things I take the most personally, because I, I could never live with myself if something really bad happened to one of my guys on my job. As a um, contractor, one of their top priorities has got to be the safety of their men. I want to send a guy home the same way he came in, safe. I want to let him go. I have a family, and I can only imagine what would happen with my family if I got hurt, and I don't want to see no one on my project get hurt. And the trades aren't just striving to ensure the safety of their workers. The things we do are not just to protect our workers, it protects the public. It protects other workers on the ground, you know, different trades. You want to make sure everybody's safe on the job site. In a high profile area like the city of Chicago, it, public safety and worker safety is, is the highest priority. The general contractors help with uh, putting overhead scaffold protection. We help uh, as we build the building higher. Uh, we put up different types of guardrail systems, fall protection, uh, mesh systems for debris control to keep the public safe. Every carpenter has certifications in safety, 30-hour OSHA, first aid CPR, uh, the equipment you have to have certifications on in order to stay safe, keep your other members of your job safe, and of course uh, make sure that the job is safe for the contractor. Nowhere is this commitment to safety more evident than at the Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters Apprentice and Training Program. Every general contractor has to have a running list of the chemicals that you're going to be exposed to. Making sure that we do it right is probably one of the top priorities. That's why we're here and that's why we're union members, you know. Pick one that you haven't had or haven't used. We come here to be taught the right way to carry that out into the field and, you know, prove that there's a reason why we have a union labor force. The first thing that you sh should be doing when you're inspecting this thing is holding it by the D hook. And then when they get on the roof, we talk about fall arrest systems, body harnesses, ropes, shock absorber lanyards, and anchor points and how, how to install them and how to work safely with them. 
After you get through all of the webbing, looks good, you gotta go into the buckles. Safety training isn't limited to just the apprentices. Journeymen often return to the training center to learn new standards or just refresh their knowledge base. Some examples of anchorage connectors are tie-off adapters. That's what we're doing at this time in the year right now. We're utilizing the union training centers to update our workers on fall protection training, scaffold training, qualified rigging, first aid and CPR, and OSHA 30 hour. It isn't just the training, but the equipment and tools the tradespeople use that are becoming safer and safer. The tools that the workers use all incorporate some sort of safety, whether it's a tool lanyard so you don't let go of it and it falls off of a building, or your fall protection so it's a part of the, the way you set things up. There are saws that are available on the market now where if skin even comes in contact with the blade, that that, that saw will, will stop within a millisecond. The best part for, from a Bosch perspective is that when a worker goes to work is able to come home without having any bodily injuries of any kind, especially when they're using our products. It's the greatest feeling that we have. Human lives matter to us. Unions spend a lot of time, more than anybody, more than any other group, training their folks on safety. The stakes for safety are so high. That's why the trades have and always will fight for the safety of workers and the public. Roy probably would be my inspiration for safety and to share that with other people and to, to say, believe me, when I say you want to go home to your kids. I would say this is sort of the Grand Canyon of the Midwest. They also call it an engineering marvel. And it is, it truly is an engineering marvel. At Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions, we take great pride in making a positive difference in the lives of people. With the broadest portfolio in the industry and the technical performance to back it up, you can design and install with confidence. Our ceiling construction expertise, training, and pre-engineered ceiling solutions make it easy for you to seamlessly transition from one end of the building to the other. Improve construction efficiencies and keep every job on time, on budget, and on the mark with Armstrong Ceiling and Wall Solutions. Faster, easier, better. Keeping restaurants and hotels up to date with the latest design trends is a constant challenge. Finding qualified contractors isn't at finishingchicago.com. We work with top designers and general contractors who use the latest painting, drywall finishing, and wall covering techniques in Chicagoland's premier hotels and restaurants. The hospitality industry relies on finishingchicago.com as its free resource to find quality finishing contractors. For a great finish, start with finishingchicago.com. Ever notice how much space that gallon of milk takes up in your refrigerator? Now imagine if you had to store 8 billion gallons. Here you can see some of the heavier rain pushing through after midnight tonight. The sewer system in the greater Chicago area is a combined sewer system. And what that means is you've got storm water and sewer water together in the same system. When you have an increase in rain events, you've got diminished capacity. Uh, I live approximately a half a mile from the Little Calumet River, and in the year of 1980, I experienced a devastating flood event. The water came all the way up into our patio and went across our family room floor and went down the basement stairs. In my residence, I had $31,000 worth of damage. Flooding has been a very serious problem for the whole community of South Holland. And uh, it's not just one area, it's, it's scattered all over. And if you ever saw the flood maps, you could see all the area that is just covered with it. November 24th, 2015, an autumn storm hit Chicago. The unrelenting rain drenches the city. At one time, a storm of this magnitude would have flooded basements, closed highways, and caused millions of dollars in damage. But now, thanks to one of the largest civil engineering projects in history, the basements remain dry. If I'm someplace and people say, South Holland, where's that at? And I'll say, have you ever driven on the toll road in south of Chicago? Oh, yeah. And I said, have you ever driven through a great big opening like the Grand Canyon? The Thornton Reservoir is a massive hole. It was carved from limestone quarry and can hold nearly 9 billion gallons of water. 
the story of its construction begins decades before and exemplifies why Chicago is called the city of broad shoulders. There are plenty of younger people in our communities today that don't know what the Deep Tunnel Project is. They've never heard of the Deep Tunnel Project. Older people like myself know exactly what it is and how long it's been around. In 1972, officials adopted the Tunnel and Reservoir Plan, or TARP. The way TARP is designed, when storms cause sewers to overflow, instead of sending sewage into the river, TARP drop shafts redirect the wastewater into tunnels hundreds of feet below the ground. The sewage flows from these tunnels into reservoirs where TARP pumping stations pump the water to reclamation plants. The wastewater is then cleaned and released back into the river. And in the 1970s, we started building it. The first step was to begin digging a network of nearly 110 miles of tunnels with the volume of 2.3 billion gallons. On a project like this one, where mere inches can mean the difference between safety and catastrophic failure, the right crew is of paramount importance. And maybe none are more important than the millwrights, elite carpenters who work primarily with machinery and equipment that requires precision. The tunnel system was operational by 2006, and in 2009, the district began construction on the Thornton Composite Reservoir. The site for the Thornton Reservoir wasn't chosen randomly, but was a strategic decision based on cost and efficiency. This hole was already here before we you know, decided to use it as a reservoir. Um, the owner of the mine actually ended up working out a deal with us where they would continue to mine it to the shape and the depth that we wanted, and then we would take it over. But the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District couldn't just take over the gaping hole in the earth. They needed highly trained specialists to prepare the site. The carpenters were involved in, in anything from forming up concrete pours. You can see the huge uh, concrete dam that we have over there. What we don't see is the groundwater protection system that goes around here. You don't want any of this wastewater or stormwater to seep into the local community. So we had to make sure that we basically created a large bathtub. We have a, a grout curtain. It basically uh, sets of holes that are drilled into the rock and we inject grout to seal up all the rock. The Millerites played a, a very important role, obviously, in this reservoir and we couldn't have done it without them. We had them play roles in implementing uh, the um, installation of the gates. These gates, 25 feet high and two feet thick, control the water in and out of the reservoir. Each of the gates weighs 100 tons. Um, and basically you need to have that kind of force to withstand uh, the, the type of water that's coming um, from uh, the back end and you need to be able to control that. So when the tunnel gets full, we want to be able to direct that water into the reservoir to be able to hold it here. When this reservoir is at capacity, we need to be able to shut that gate in order to hold the water in here until it's ready to be pumped to Calumet plant to be cleaned in the natural process. The Thornton Quarry is so large, it can fit nearly 74 great pyramids of Giza, pharaohs not included. Wow, that's impressive. It's amazing what we can achieve when we put our best and brightest to work. If you thought the Thornton Quarry was an impressive feat, wait until you see the Grand Canyon of the Midwest. The Thornton Reservoir in South Holland, Illinois, has a capacity of 7.9 billion gallons and services an area of 91 square miles, which includes not only Chicago, but over a dozen other Illinois towns. Conceived in the 1960s to prevent flooding and stem the flow of raw sewage into the area's waterways, the reservoir has only one problem. It's never been tested. So in November um, 2015, we had a very uh, intense rain event um, in the Chicagoland area, and specifically, Thornton came into play. I believe it was between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we had torrential rains, and uh, I know that that was the first, probably the first real use of the Thornton Reservoir where the gates were open. We were able to hold 400 million gallons of storm water um, in the reservoir, and it was very successful didn't go into the community. Uh, instead of houses flooding, roads flooding, it, went, it, it, it served its purpose. It went into the reservoir like it was supposed to. Public Works has saved money based on the fact that it's the garbage pickup, it's the debris pickup, it's the cleanup afterwards. Uh, 
also signage, detours, and personnel to man the detours. So that all adds up to a tremendous amount of money for the municipality. Our estimates indicate that $14 million uh, per year in flood damage is going to be mitigated um, with the creation and the use of this uh, reservoir. Because of the Thornton Reservoir, homes will be protected, money will be saved, and valuable resources once used to combat and alleviate flooding can be used elsewhere. This is only the beginning. 20 miles northwest of Thornton, an even more ambitious project is taking place. There were portions of a quarry that existed at the time. We essentially have to dig the hole and the tunnels to connect it. This site is going to be 10 billion gallons. Thornton was a mere 7.9 billion gallons. So we've got a little more um, excavation and aggregate that we have to deal with. Just to give you a visual in terms of trying to grasp the size of this location, you could fit 11 soldier fields uh, on, on the surface and then another stacked 11 soldier fields on top of that. A project of this size and scope requires dozens of different organizations and specialists to work together for one common goal, the safe and successful operation of the reservoir. You know, we couldn't do a project like this without uh, carpenters as well as other trades. Uh, they play uh, a, an important, critical part in any kind of project uh, like this. And nothing is more critical than the ability to control the flow of water in and out of the reservoir. So the Gates and McCook are probably between 50 and 75,000 pounds apiece, and they work very similarly to the Gates that are in Thornton. The difference in McCook is McCook is leading to the Deep Tunnel Project or leading to Thornton. The very first thing that has to be done is the gates have to be installed on the walls of the tunnel. The gate rails from one end to the other in 300 feet, the allowable misalignment allowed is 10 thousandths of an inch in 300 feet. This is what millwrights do. This is what we do. We can accurately install these guides and tracks for these gates so that when the gate is picked up by a crane and set into the hole, the gate will slide effortlessly from top to bottom. Tremendous amount of engineering work goes into this because of elevations, because of flow. I mean, there's no pumps that makes this water flow, so it has to be on a gradient that is downhill from where it starts all the way to the lowest point. With the completion of McCook in 2029, TARP will finally be finished. The 109 miles of tunnels of both Thornton and McCook reservoirs, all of it will be online. But by then, we will have already saved hundreds of millions of dollars and kept nearly four million people safe and dry. Every gallon of water that we capture in here is a gallon of water that either doesn't make its way to the waterway or doesn't make its way into somebody's basement. Homes are being saved, people's lives are not being disrupted. I think it's a wonderful thing. I feel uh, much safer living here now since the Corps has been online. The Grand Canyon, and I also call it an engineering marvel. And it is, it truly is an engineering marvel. I'm still in awe of it. Um, I'm still excited to be part of a project like this, that it was conceptualized over 50 years ago, that these people had the foresight and the vision um, to think up something like this, and that it's effective and it's doing its job today, um, I think is incredible. I wanted to travel, I wanted to just get out there and experience life, and uh, what better way than join the military. Stavila for over 125 years has led the industry in measuring and leveling. Still manufactured in Germany since 1865, tradesmen rely on Stavila every day for its precision and durability. We continue to revolutionize the way we build with our lasers, levels, and laser distance measuring tools on commercial and residential job sites around the world. Stabila, how true pros measure. Meet the new family of Blaze Laser Measures from Bosch. Go ahead, turn it on and start measuring. It's that simple. The Blaze family offers a wide range of functions to tackle any measuring job. Extend your reach with accuracy up to a 16th of an inch. With Bluetooth enabled devices, 
easily transfer measurements to your smartphone or tablet with free Bosch apps. Reach farther, work faster, and stay accurate with the Bosch Blaze family of laser measures. Measure on. As a veteran of the Marine Corps, our team member Rob North has a special appreciation for the following story. Thank you, guys. I can tell you from experience, the Corps builds the strongest people. And it's that training that helps us overcome unimaginable challenges. The couple in our next story shows us what built to last truly means. Superheroes were my role model, and so I kind of wanted to be the superhero growing up. You know, I wanted to have an adventurous life as well. I wanted to travel. I wanted to leave the state of Illinois and then beyond that, the country, really. I went to Oswego High School. Uh, I didn't do so well, but my plans are to join the Marine Corps. The first time I met Kyle, I was hanging out with my friend Christy, and she had been invited to go to a party. And I invited her over at around 12 o'clock at night, expecting her to come within the next hour or so. And she didn't come up until the sun had started coming up. And it's just Kyle and his friend, like in a tent in the backyard, like trying to go to sleep. They were tickling us, trying to keep us awake, and I wasn't having it. They didn't really want to do anything, so we left. And so I was really annoyed when I first met her. And then a week later, I... Kyle was throwing another party, and he invited us, and we came. She was, man, she looked great. That was when I got to really know Kyle, and we talked for a while. She's like, man, this girl is awesome. And she, she got called uh, by one of her friends away. And so I was sitting there by myself, and I remember, and I stared straight up in the sky, and I said, God, thinking to myself, I said, God, this is the one. So when I first found out that Kyle wanted to join the Marines, it's like a little bit embarrassing to admit this, but I didn't know what the Marines actually were. I want to join the Marines, or at least the military, since I was a little kid. So I joined at 16, so when I was 18, I didn't even have to wait that long before I shipped out. After finishing boot camp, Kyle returned home on leave. We wanted to get married, and we had brought it up to our parents, and they immediately denied it because we were 18 years old. So we weren't able to do a proper wedding and, uh, you know, have her in a gown, have me in a suit. They got married at the local courthouse, and Kyle returned to base to complete his training. After Kyle and I got married, I flew out to California, moved in with him. Living in that lifestyle, you learn to really appreciate the little things. If he's able to stay at home for a night, you know, that's amazing. I got sent to School of Infantry, where I was trained to be a rifleman. And then I got sent to 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines from there, where immediately I went to Bridgeport, California for mountain warfare training. And I was sent to Afghanistan in August 31st, 2011. So unfortunately, I, I only had uh, one deployment. And I, you know, I, you hear guys are doing like four, six, eight tours, and I wish I could have done that, but that's just the, the nature of the beast. I was out on a, a patrol and noticed a like freshly dug up pile of dirt really and i i stopped and i turned around and i said to my team leader i'm not i'm not feeling good about this I'm like what do you want me to do and so he said turn around and we'll walk around the area you're suspicious about and i turned around and you know was walking back and as soon as i turned around like the very first step i stepped on what was a pressure plate and Mid-air, I remember thinking, oh, I'm being blown up right now, okay. And I just remember closing my eyes and really just letting go. One of the other Marines in the patrol came up on me and he started applying the tourniquet and, and he said, you're gonna be all right, you're gonna be all right. And at that point, I, I kind of like lifted up to kind of like see my legs if they were still there and they were gone. And it was just, I mean, it looked bad, but I, I specifically remember saying, I, I went, yep, just because I knew. I knew they were gone. The phone call woke me up, and it was a gunnery sergeant from headquarters Marines. It was the most terrible week of my life because all I knew was that Kyle was injured. I didn't know if he was conscious. I didn't know, you know, if he was going to be okay. And I couldn't see him. I couldn't talk to him and I just had to wait. 
It was three days after I got injured before I was able to speak to Alex, and I remember specifically thinking, and I don't know why I thought it, but I just remember thinking that she's not gonna love me anymore. So the, the first time I saw her, I believe it was in the ICU. He was like wrapped up in blankets. All I could see was his eyes and his nose. It's definitely a sense of relief to see him in person, but then not too long after that, they were kind of telling us, you know, visiting hours are over, it's time to leave, and there's no way. Like, I finally get to be with my husband. I'm not about to walk away. Fortunately, we had a, a great nurse that allowed her to stay in there and, and sleep right next to me. And Alex stayed at his side through a long, difficult recovery. There was just a lot of surgeries, a lot of infections, and we ended up being at Walter Reed for about three and a half years. When you get amputated, they take muscle and fat tissue and wrap around the ends of your femurs to prepare for cushioning for the prosthetic. And I'm a skinny guy, so when I walk, it's literally on the tips of my femurs. Uh, it's very, very painful, and so unfortunately, prosthetics didn't really work out for me. He was like, okay, this is my life situation, so what do we do next? After over a dozen surgeries and almost four years in rehab, Alex and Kyle finally went home. I'm proud to say we made it through and we're in such a better place now and we really relied on each other. You know, I would like to say that, you know, I helped Kyle out so much, but I honestly think he helped me more than I helped him. Both have returned to school. Alex is pursuing a degree in occupational therapy and Kyle? I'm trying to get my degree. I'm not sure what in yet. Uh, just knocking out the, the gen eds for now. So there's an Operation Warrior Wishes in St. Charles. They referred me to Jared Allen. I created Jared Allen's Home for Wounded Warriors back in 2009. I went on a USO trip over to uh, Iraq and uh, Kuwait. And when I came home, I just knew I had to do something to serve those who serve us. So um, I was made aware about the deficiencies in adaptive housing. Sharing that value of serving those who have served our country, the Carpenters have committed their labor and resources to support Jared Allen's homes for wounded warriors. They only choose one wounded warrior to build a house for each year, so it's a very selective process. We're not just gonna write a check. We're not just going to widen some doors and make it handicap accessible. We make each home, you know, functional for the individual that specifically to their needs. Like too many military families across the nation, the struggle is very real for Kyle and Alex. An adaptive home would make a huge difference for them. Over the course of this season, we'll continue to check in with the Mosers as they rebuild their lives. That's all for this episode of Built to Last. From the entire Built to Last family, we would like to express our gratitude to the members of the U.S. Armed Forces and their families. We'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Visit the Built to Last website to learn about these topics and more.